my name is Joe McCoy, <coughs> and uh, I'm chair of the Historic Preservation Commission for the City of Santa Cruz. Uh, okay, so I'm going to do a little intro on Frank Swart. Many of you are familiar with Frank. I suspect many of you are probably from the university. You look like you belong there. So. <laughs> uh, anyway, so uh, Frank arrived at UC Santa Cruz as a student at Powell College in 1967 when the campus was a couple of years old and the students were walking across planks uh, over the pipe trenches that were still open. Uh, he graduated in mathematics from UCS. He studied architecture at Princeton. Uh, after graduation, he worked for a number of architectural firms in Princeton, LA, Santa Monica, Aptos. Frank Worcester, uh, is Worcester working at Aptos at the time? No, just Aptos. Uh, Philadelphia and Carmel before returning to Santa Cruz in 1985 as a staff architect and project manager. Uh, Frank uh, commenced a long and distinguished career at UCSC that spanned the tenures of seven UCSC chancellors. He became campus architect in 1988 and directed UCSC's Office of Physical Planning and Construction uh, until his retirement in April 2010. From 1999 until 2010, he held the title of Associate Vice Chancellor for Physical Planning and Construction. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you campus architect emeritus, Frank Swan. Thank you, Joe. Um, this is going to be a very personal talk. Um, and it's going to start uh, even earlier than 1967. Uh, it's going to start in 1964. That's my, that's the portrait from my junior year high school yearbook. And the reason that I'm showing it is that that's the beginning. Uh, this is about the time of the beginning of my relationship with UC Santa Cruz. I grew up in Pasadena and I came to breakfast one morning uh, and my dad said, oh, there's an article in the LA Times this morning about a new campus that uh, the University of California is going to open in Santa Cruz and you might be interested in it. And I think, I can't be sure, but now that all of the LA Times digi files are available digitally, I looked and found this is December of 1964, which is about the time I would have been thinking about um, starting, you know, where to, where to apply to college. And Santa Cruz was in my, in my sights, on my radar screen ever since then. Uh, I applied and as Joe said, I entered in 1967. <clears throat> um, Graduated in, in 71, went back east, spent two years working in Southern California, and then went back and started architecture school at Princeton in 1973, where out of an opening class, uh, uh, in an entering class of 15 students, two of us had been undergraduates at Santa Cruz. Um, graduated in 76, and uh, I guess I could say couldn't wait to get back to California. Had a series of, of um, positions in different architectural firms, including uh, one in Aptos with Richard Peterson. Richard had been the campus planner on campus at UCSC from 1968 to about 1972. And so working with him, I learned a lot about the early history of the campus and the architects involved. And that was my introduction. We did a lot of small projects on the campus. That was really my introduction to actually doing architectural work at the campus. Um, uh, as Joe said, I joined the staff in 1985 and fast forward to 2010 when I retired and just about the time of my retirement, I was at a, uh, a dedica the dedication for the new Digital Arts Research Center and I was approached by someone who I recognized but had never talked to, Jim Clifford. Uh, and he said, you're Frank Swart, aren't you? And I said, yeah, and you're Jim Clifford, aren't you? And he said, yes. So he started, we started a conversation about the architecture of the campus, and that led to a collaboration that resulted in an exhibition in 2015 as part of the campus's 15 year, uh, 50 year uh, anniversary celebration about the architectural history of the campus. And so much of what you'll see today was drawn from the work I did on that. And then again, fast forward to um, more recently, about two years ago, I had a call about contributing an article to the uh, Museum of Art and History's occasional journal about architecture and, or uh, planning and environmental issues in Santa Cruz. So in that, which I promised them I would give a plug, uh, you can buy at the museum or at that website. Uh, I did an article that dug a little more deeply into what the university did, what led to the regents deciding to put a campus in Santa Cruz and the early planning for the campus. That's, that's the, uh, 
the basis of the article. And much of what I'll talk about today is in there, but it's, there's, there's a lot in the article that you won't hear about this morning, and there's much today that's not in the article. Um, so, but that was, that was the basis for it. And then I was asked to give a talk in January to research anonymous at the museum, and so that led to this particular talk, and, and uh, I've tuned it up a little bit for you, but it's pretty much the same as I, as I did then. So because it was Researchers Anonymous, I will talk as I go along about the sources and resources I used in putting the talk together, learning about these things. Um, every now and then, things will pop up, what I call hidden jewels and surprises, things that surprised me along the way. And we'll look at a few things that didn't happen that might have, uh, and we can decide whether we're happier with them or without them. And finally, at the end, I hope there'll be time for me to show a few things from what I call the cutting room floor, things that there wasn't room for uh, in, the, in the article for the, for the History Journal. So I have to give the public library the first billing on principal sources, and you'll see actually in the presentation some of the clippings I found about the effort to um, locate a university uh, here in Santa Cruz. Uh, the university library, of course, has lots of, lots of records in the, in the general collections, in the special collections. Gordon Sinclair, who I'll talk about later, was a major factor in bringing the university here. Uh, records of the office that I used to manage were helpful. Many of them are now in, in um, are now in the, in the library, uh, digital collections, and then the oral histories from the Regional History Project, which I recommend to you as a wonderful resource about many aspects of local history. Um, there are only two campuses at the University of California that have regional history projects, us and Berkeley. And in fact, that was one of the sources uh, that I used talking about some of the architects who did work here in the early days, and then the archives at the College of Environmental Design. But I recommend those oral histories to you as really interesting snapshots of particular moments in time and that's really what today's talk is about. It's really a very specific moment in time and a very specific, well, two specific places, California as a whole and Santa Cruz in particular. And then the Los Angeles Times had interesting uh, information on the website. They had a, um, an education reporter who did some very interesting things about UC Santa Cruz. He paid a lot of attention to it. He has an interesting oral history as well at, the, at I think it's at Cal State Northridge. And then finally, Bill Doyle, who was one of the founding faculty members with Roots in Watsonville, did a little book a few years ago on the origins of UC Santa Cruz, and he goes into much more detail than either I or my article did, or I will today, or my article did about, uh, about bringing, bringing the university here. So my art, the article in the, in the um, library journal starts off uh, with, with these words, central to, I probably should have said central to the UC Santa Cruz creation myth is the tale of a legendary summertime bus ride. In fact, I was at some function on campus as I was working on this article, and somebody I knew a little bit said, I told him I was working on this article, he said, well, I always heard about a bus ride, and I said, that's the opening line for, um, for my article, uh, and this is the front page of the Sentinel that day, July 21st, the, the tour was on the 20th. The Regents from the university's office of the president in Berkeley came down to Santa Cruz to visit the site and then went over to Almaden. We'll talk about that more as we, as we get to it in the chronological review of what's happening. But I'll call your attention to that diagram. And as I was going through the files, I believe this was in the special collections at UCSC, I came across a folder which, a, a little brochure that the, that the city and county and the, and the um, Chamber of Commerce had a committee to attract the university here. This was the cover of the committee. And you can see, uh, here's seven, Highway 17 coming in. Here's the uh, bridge. Uh, it's a whole different vision of a campus than you would imagine. I mean, I'm describing it to University of California people. It looks sort of like UC Riverside, which was built in the 50s and 60s on the, on the Cal Ranch. Uh, but that is, I think, what the people who envisioned the campus thought a new college campus was going to look like. Setting the stage, uh, and much of this is from a study that I'll talk about a little later that, that the regents hired in order where, to determine where to, um, where to locate the, the South Central Coast campus. Uh, the Santa Cruz was seen as something of a backwater. It had the highest proportion of people over age, age 65 in any city in the state uh, the median income educational level and number of college graduates were below other urban areas in California. And until Cabrillo College opened, uh, there were no education possibilities behind high school in the county. During the 1950s, 
it was expected, this is really the baby boom and the, the post-war baby boom, the statewide population was expected to grow by 50%. Santa Cruz was only gonna grow at about 10%. At least that's what all the demogra demographers were, were predicting. But by the time we get to the 1960s, uh, things were starting to change. There had been a big flood uh, in 1955 downtown and there was a big redevelopment effort uh, that channeled the river, that built uh, some new buildings and that was seen as impressive uh, by, by outsiders looking at Santa Cruz. Uh, in October of 1958, uh, there was a, a junior college district established by an election and a couple of years later, 75% approval, a big number, uh, approved a bond issue to fund the initial construction of uh, Cabrillo College, which, which preceded University of California by a few years. Um, and then in May, in 1959 and 1960, the, it was clear in reading the documents that both the city and the county were trying to see themselves as progressive, uh, as progressive entities and doing a more serious look at planning into the future with its, the city's first capital improvement program and the county uh, releasing a preliminary general plan and then a final general plan looking out to 1985. And that leads us to our first surprise. One of the real surprises that I found is in this June 59 draft of the preliminary general plan, the word Greenbelt appears nine times. Uh, I mean, it was always my impression that the Greenbelt grew out of the sort of anti-growth sentiments from the, from the 70s, but in fact, it was an old idea. And the second surprise of this was that there were, again, you can see, uh, trying, to, trying to set up Greenbelts to, to limit growth. Um, the other real surprise was to see the extent of citizens' participation in this 1959 uh, preliminary general plan draft. Over and over again, there's talk about uh, a green belt. Our group would like our area to remain as it is now with the understanding that if major changes in county development occur, we should be given an opportunity to be heard. Or major findings indicate a desire to be kept informed on all developments, to conserve resources, to protect the county's scenery, rural character, and clean air. All of this stuff could be said today. So the, 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 the roots of Santa Cruz being a special place have been in the, the local consciousness for well over 50 years. Uh, but in the final document, Greenbelt is only mentioned once. And I have no idea what happened, uh, how that, you know, one can, one can speculate, but it's something that I was scratching my head over that, uh, that I, I, didn't, I didn't come up with a good explanation for. Looking more broadly, uh, California, I mean, I am a child of the baby boom. I was born in 1950, and Kevin Starr, the eminent California historian, uh, mentioned that by 1960s, uh, both of its members would be only four, way, four years away from entering college, and the state was trying to get ready for them. In the mid-40s, they'd actually set up, under the California Constitution, the regents of the University of California are constitutionally autonomous from the rest of state government. But there was a need, the state university and the community colleges are actually part of state government and are under the auspices of the State Board of Education. It was clear that there needed to be coordination between those two bodies, so, so going back to 1945, a liaison committee was set up to work on those things. In 1955, anticipating the baby boom, uh, they did what's called the restudy of the needs for California higher education. In 1956, they looked at where new, um, where new centers of public higher education should be, and they identified four regions of the state for a new University of California campus. We, we in, in Santa Cruz were part of what was called the South Central uh, California Coast section. Uh, this, this effort also gave rise to the campuses at San Diego and Irvine. Uh, the, third, the, fourth, the fourth place to look at was actually the Central Valley, but no, no campus was built there until UC Merced came along 12 or 15 years ago. Now, when I, would give this, when I would give this talk primarily to younger audiences, I would talk about the spirit of California in the post-war era, that everything was possible, skies were blue, everything was, everything was, was changing, lots of uh, people had either moved here, I had the impression that lots of servicemen came through California on their way to the Pacific Theater and then wound up staying here on their way back. And I would talk about Look Magazine, uh, and Life Magazine having articles about California. The whole nation was looking at California. Well, and when was this? In about, probably about 2010, uh, after my, my parents had both died, my brothers and I were cleaning out the house we'd grown up in in Pasadena, and I was going through my dad's 
my dad's uh, dresser and next to me my brother in his closet going through a stack of old newspapers and lo and behold he found those very those very articles so it was look like there was even one I don't didn't do a picture of Newsweek um, and opening up the Look magazine, those of you who know UC Santa Cruz will recognize the picture of Paige Smith, the founding co uh, provost of Cal College. Educator in paradise, 2,000 acres of campus, another California dream coming true. This is the University of California at Santa Cruz, and it eventually will have 27,500 students. Will it ever be big or impersonal? It cannot, for it will consist of 20 or more little liberal arts colleges, each directed by a provost who will live on his campus. So again, uh, I think alternative histories, uh, this, this slide falls into that category. Um, in, the October, in October of 1957, the regents made two really critical decisions. They appointed Clark Kerr, who was then chancellor at Berkeley, as president of the entire system. And they also approved the start of a site selection process for three new campuses, planning for the three new campuses. Not coincidentally, this was the first regents meeting after which the former Soviet Union launched Sputnik 1, which set off uh, quite uh, what was called the space race. And editorials from the New York Times said, we need to catch up with those dirty Ruskies. We need to improve our educational system. Um, it just seemed to be a very interesting, uh, co well, I don't, I don't think it was a coincidence, con conjunction of time. The uh, Santa Cruz didn't waste any time in starting to lobby to receive one of those campuses. Uh, that Regents meeting was in the middle of October. Within a month and a half, middle of November, about a month later, they, they hosted UC administrators who looked at four sites, Aromas, a little north of Watsonville, La Selva Beach, and the Cowell Home Ranch in Santa Cruz, and they drove around. And there's correspondence related to this in the, in the special collections uh, at, and archives at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, and I'll call attention here to Gordon Sinclair. He was the editor of the Sentinel at the time, and the chair of the, of the, the Chamber of Commerce had set up a committee that included community members to try and attract the University of California. Bill Doyle's book gives a very, uh, a very interesting thumbnail biography of Sinclair. He himself sort of worked his way up from a copy boy. He was not educated. Uh, he did not have a college education, but he was clearly a self-educated man and cared passionately about education, worked his way up from being a copy boy at the Sentinel to being its editor. And we'll see him, we'll see him appear from time to time as, as we go through the story. Um, in order to, as part of this, they put together um, a fact sheet uh, in, intended to attract the regents and to sell the benefits of the, of the Santa Cruz area to, uh, to the university committee about how, why Santa Cruz would be a good university committee, community. This county of contrasts and Santa Cruz is the hub of its county. From an economic standpoint, the city has stabilized its traditional resort trade and agricultural products by obtaining light industrial plants as well as serving as the trading center for more than 50,000 persons. One of the lowest crime rates in the state, a clean city, clean air, and clean citizens. <laughs> a city of churches of all denominations and a city without racial prejudices. An estimated 3,000 dwelling units available for use during the school year without cramping its normal transient accommodations. <laughs> Due to the fact that the city has thousands of tourists during the season, it's connected with a network of freeways <laughs> providing for first-class auto travel. The language is so 1960s, it's just great. Excellent highway co connections to virtually every major city. They even included a map of the proposed uh, highways, multi-lane highways from 1963 in that, in that document. And then there was correspondence. This again, you're gonna see correspondence from Gordon Clare, Sinclair over and over again to, to Hal Hyde, who went on to become the campus's first, um, first business vice chancellor and served in that capacity for many years in the early days of the campus. But what was interesting was the Watsonville, California alumni um, were particularly mentioned, and again, in going through the correspondence, the, the local alumni associations, both in Santa Cruz and in Watsonville, were very instrumental in getting the new UC campus here. Uh, this is a letter that Sinclair wrote to James Corley, who at the time was the vice president for university relations. Uh, and I think he was the, an executive assistant to, to Clark Kerr, to President Kerr. But 
He also included copies of editorial, editorials that Sinclair had written um, on the subject of education. So to him, getting education was extremely important and he was lobbying for that in ways far beyond bringing a, a UC campus here, here to Santa Cruz. So 1958 proved to be a very, very busy year. The university published selection criteria for three new campuses, and I'll, I'll look at each of these in detail as we go through. Uh, a study, a site selection study was worked on by Lawrence Livingston, a planner, and John Carl Warnicke, an architect who may be best known for his work in Washington, D.C. Um, and I, I'll have some John Carl Warnicke stories to tell as we go along. And then Sinclair and the Chamber of Commerce UC Campus Site Committee started lobbying like mad to get a UC, a UC campus here in Santa Cruz. So this is a, a, a kind of boring looking uh, bureaucratic document from January of 1958, the, the collection criteria. This was before the, 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 the restudy work had looked at uh, I can't remember what the other designations were, but essentially San Diego County, Orange County, and parts of southern portions of Los Angeles County in the South Central Coast study. And they wanted to set up some criteria to be more specific. I'll point out two names. Bob Evans was a university architect. He worked in the Office of the President system-wide. Uh, and I actually met Bob. He lived to the ripe old age of 102. And one of the things I came across in his folders, uh, once, once they were moving forward, he, he had some handwritten notes uh, arguing for the position of a uh, campus architect, why each campus should have a campus architect. And he had, in typical good human resources form, skills, knowledges, and abilities. And the first thing, he, I can't remember if it was the first thing he mentioned or the last thing he mentioned that a campus architect needed was a sense of humor. And I, uh, that really endeared me to Bob. Professor Wheelock was actually a retired naval officer who was at the uh, what was then the Scripps Institution. He was an ocean, he was a naval architect. He designed some ships during World War II. He actually retired to Carmel and was on the campus planning committee. And there's actually correspondence, a lot of correspondence between him and Dean McHenry about planning for the new campus. And this is sort of the index of things that they were looking for in the in the in the new campus. In particular, the size, each of them was to be about 25,000 students. The relationship to the population, they were supposed to be close to the population. And clearly, as you'll see as the story goes on, that's one thing that Santa Cruz couldn't argue. Some of its assets that we'll see in a moment, uh, they used to counter the fact that we were kind of far away from, from the population centers. Um, this is what I found really interesting. They didn't want to put, they weren't going to put a new University of California campus in Palo Alto, for example. They didn't want a new UC in Stanford competing in the same geographical region. So they wanted to make sure that these, that these places were, were well distributed. Uh, and they also wanted a community that um, would attract both students and faculty. They, they saw the job of opening a new University of California campus, particularly given the University of California's high academic standards, they needed to be able to attract a distinguished faculty and good students. So they wanted the community itself to be attractive to people who might be coming to a new, to a new campus. Here's one of the surprises I found. Can you imagine today in a bureaucratic document actually listing aesthetics as a criteria for use? I mean, just this paragraph. California is endowed with many areas of great natural beauty. It is fitting that over the years the best of these be preserved and devoted to public use. It seems appropriate that the state university develop its cultural centers on inspiring sites. So that's one of the cards that, that you'll see that the Santa Cruz committee played in order to attract the regions. Uh, it also talked about, this is what I was mentioning earlier, a fine living environment to help meet the challenge of recruiting good faculty and good students. Uh, and this is a letter that I found, a handwritten letter that I found in the university archives. Its source is not given, but it was in Hal Hyde's paper, so I suspect that he wrote it to the planner, Lawrence Livingston. Is that his, is that his handwriting? Okay. <laughs> We are a producing area. This is selling Santa Cruz County to the, to the planner who is working 
on determining where the new campus could go. Our agri agricultural products and processed foods go from here throughout the world. We have direct teletype lines throughout the land, and our banks clear the payments from afar. Our agriculture is teamed with science in the production and processing. An example is humidified cold storage apples by local experiment for Gerber products. What manner of people do this? Practically every country in the world is represented. We have no prejudice problems. Our Phi Beta Kappa judge, son of immigrant Slavs, our bank president and California Bankers Association uh, president last term, uh, the son of immigrant Danes, our Iranian implement dealership manager, current president of the California Junior Chamber of Commerce, who recently took time at the request of the State Department to go address student groups in Manila, Bangkok, Hong Kong, et cetera. Our young fourth, maybe, generation Watsonville, fighting Pulitzer Prize winning editor, our lawyer who arbitrates labor problems throughout the county, our ichthyologists, volcanologists, generals, colonels, coffee roasters, that's interesting, <laughs> social, a social worker with an order of something from Pope Pius. I mean, this letter is a letter that is oozing civic pride. I just, I just I just found it quite, quite wonderful to read. And, and there are cultural advantages in Santa Cruz too. We have a, a, I can't remember that, service association, an art association with a gallery, a local painters group, a Baroque music society which plays concerts throughout the area. We have how, fill in the blank churches, our association, American Association of University Women is active. 165 or so active members from fill in the blank universities. We have many good people who would actively support a university, so please don't put us down as all negative from an environmental point of view. I just, I just, Hal will return in this story. It's really quite wonderful. So Sinclair, back to Gordon Sinclair, the editor, he was soliciting letters from community organizations to send to the regions, to the office of the president, to attract the university. And he asked that they all come through him so that he would pass them on, coordinate them, and pass them on. So there were letters from the National Association of Retired Civil Employees. This is my favorite, the State Federation of Chaparral Poets Santa Cruz Chapter. <laughs> the Historical Society. The Animal Welfare Association. The U.S. Naval Reserve Training Center. I mean, it's just such a great picture of civic life in the 1960s. The Junior League, the YWCA. First of all, it should be pointed out, Santa Cruz can provide an exceptionally wholesome environment. As evidence of the high moral tone of the town, we cite the fact that the rate of crime and juvenile delinquency in the area is so low in comparison with the thickly populated stations of the state. And the Santa Cruz Women's Club, who probably, not coincidentally, whose president, Mrs. Fred McPherson was the wife of the publisher of the Sentinel. So the Sentinel was all in on this deal. The first congregational church, interestingly enough, as you'll see later on, many of the meetings that determined the future of the Santa Cruz campus were held in their, in their uh, conference room, in their meeting room. And here's the surprise. The third, they're the third oldest congregational church in the state and one of the founders of the University of California was pastor here in Santa Cruz. So there were the letters of support from community organizations. Sinclair himself wrote letters to the state set, local senator uh, and assembly member, to the governor, to the superintendent of public instruction, to the speaker of the assembly, and to a whole slew of the UC regions. There's indication that in April 1968, there was a big luncheon at the very elite Pacific Union Club in San Francisco. Samuel Leask of the Leask department store family was the city of Los Angeles' first administrative officer. He was busily involved lobbying Southern California regions to bring the, the, the campus here. Uh, the city manager, the chair of the Bank of America, the publisher and the managing editor of the San Francisco Examiner, and the vice president of what was then Pacific Telephone and Telegraph. So they were, they were really going to the, to the, to the ruling elite as well as to the to the politicians to try and get it and then this it was in this context that that brochure that I showed the cover of earlier was published an invitation to the University of California illustrated with wonderful photographs of the area the Cal Ranch and some of its kilns an aerial photograph of the Cal Ranch you can see the the reservoir recently removed Bay Reservoir with nothing around it and then lots of uh, data, the weather, the rainfall, the specific criteria. A city on the march. 
urban redevelopment, flood control, yacht harbor, off-street parking, shoreline erosion control, water development, freeway bypass, new city library. Everything's up to date here in Santa Cruz. <laughs> A clean, livable city lends itself to university life, free from crime and congestion. There are no rivers of smog to irritate the eyes, nor valleys of vice to destroy the temperance of conduct. <laughs> Santa Cruz offers tranquil yet progressive surroundings. And that's, I think, that is, I mean, clearly Santa Cruz was, was thinking of itself as a highly progressive community. I think that just comes through everything that I came across. In this compatible environment, both the university and the community could grow together. It is the type of community that is attractive to faculty and students alike. They were playing, clearly, whoever put this together had read the criteria for selecting a campus and were crafting their message based on those criteria. Free from disturbing factors and small enough that the university can exert a strong influence in molding the community's future. And again, it talks about the fact that we've got lots of rental housing, so housing's not gonna be a problem, even with a student enrollment of 25,000. And here's a hidden jewel that has nothing to do with Santa Cruz, but I came across it in the, when you see this little thing here, that's from UCSC Special Collections and Archives. Um, this is an architect who practiced in the Bay Area and I think taught a little bit at Berkeley, uh, created a plan for a university in Northern California. This is not at Santa Cruz, it's actually on landfill at the eastern end of the San Mateo Bridge. There's that proposal, again though, the style of the buildings are very much like the cover of the brochure that, that we saw. Makes me wonder whether they had asked him to develop that drawing. I, I found no, no indication of who did that, that earlier drawing that I showed you, so maybe they had rice work on it. But I want to call your attention to this tall tower. That's going to come back into our story in a few minutes. So then, there's the Livingston and Warnicke report. Uh, looking for a location for the South Central Coast campus. Uh, Livingston and Warnicke were both educated undergraduates at Stanford and then went to the East Coast. Uh, I think Livingston got a planning degree and a law degree at Yale. Warnicke uh, studied architecture at Harvard, uh, maybe best known for his rumored affair with, uh, with Jackie Kennedy. He designed the John Kennedy gravesite, for example. Uh, they looked at 74 sites, those are all of the blue blobs on the, in, the, in the map on the right. Uh, took a closer look at 15 of them and then did detailed studies of four different sites, uh, three of them over and around San Jose uh, and then the Cal Ranch here in Santa Cruz. And ultimately, as you'll see, it came down to a contest between the Almaden site, sites number three and four. Uh, in February of 1959, they made a final recommendation to the regents, and in it they said, if it were decided that a campus that would grow slowly in a situation where a university-oriented community could develop around it, the Cowell Ranch offers the best promise of those goals. But if attracting a large en enrollment in a relatively short time and relief of the Berkeley campus are more important, then one of the sites in Santa Clara Valley should be, should be chosen. In December of that year, the special committee recommended further studies of the Almaden site. And that set off what Hal Hyde in his oral history called the unselling of the Almaden site. Uh, they sent more letters to regents and state officials. They started a national publicity campaign. And then there was the bus trip that we talked about earlier. And the, the story goes, that a bunch of regents and officers from the Office of the President got on a bus in Berkeley, came down to Santa Cruz, and from everything that I've read, their visit to the Santa Cruz campus was highly and effectively choreographed. They had the roads ready, they drove them through the campus, they were all in an air-conditioned bus. Uh, I think they stopped at the First Congregational Church for refreshments before they went up to see the campus. Uh, they had some presentations and then they headed over the hill to uh, San Jose, well, we know what the weather is like in July here versus the Almaden Valley. Apparently, when they got to the Almaden Valley, uh, they hadn't done the planning that the Santa Cruz people had. The roads were too small for the bus, so they had to get out of the big air-conditioned bus and into small vans that weren't air-conditioned. Uh, they could see suburbia creeping up on them. There was some smog in the distance. <laughs> and according to Dean McHenry's oral history, one of the regents, uh, maybe Dorothy Chandler said, why it had cost us a fortune to air condition a campus there. So for many years, that was one of the boons, one of the, one of the real problems in my job. 
is that the campus has had a policy of not air conditioning for human comfort. So every September when we get those four or five days when temperatures were in the 90s, the emails would start to fly about why aren't we air conditioning this or air conditioning that. And we'd wait for the fog to come in and then that would settle down and we'd look forward to it in the following year. So it was really clear in looking at the correspondence around this time that the, that, the, the, that Santa Cruz, the Santa Cruz proponents were following a double strategy. Downplay the, downplay the distance to the Bay Area population centers and focus both on the beauty of the site and the city and county's willingness to welcome the community and integrate it into, it, into its existence. So in July, that, the, that was the, the regions that, as you'll recall, the bus ride was on the 20th. July 22nd, so it just preceded by a couple of days of Regents meeting, they deferred the decision on the Central Coast site. Uh, they narrowed the alternative to here, the Cal Rancher in Santa Cruz and the Albaden site, and then told, the, uh, told, the Santa, told Santa Cruz, the Santa Cruz proponents, that they could study uh, the Cal Ranch site further. Uh, and in September of that meeting, they <laughs> agreed to share with the, with the community uh, the cost of additional master planning for the Santa Cruz site. Uh, at about the same time, President Kerr asked a three-member faculty committee chaired by William Worcester, the, dean of the, the founding dean of the College of Environmental Design at Berkeley, and psychology professor Clarence Brown, philosophy professor Stephen Pepper, to visit the two sites and make a recommendation to him, and they unanimously recommended the Cal Ranch site. Due to the natural beauty of the site, it talks about Amadin is pretty nice, but the site of the Cal Ranch is spectacular and goes on to describe the views that we all know uh, and love. It is one of the great scenic areas of California. Uh, and then they, they, they voted for the Cal Ranch. It also didn't hurt that um, in dealing with a Cal Ranch site, they only had to deal with one property owner, which would have been the Cal Foundation, whereas over in, in Albaden, there were a whole series of property owners. And the, the, I, think it, I think at about this time, there's, there's, there's um, correspondence where the Cal Foundation agreed to sell the, they, they valued the land as agricultural land rather than as developable land. So that lowered the price as far as the regions were concerned, and they agreed to donate a portion of the purchase price back to the campus for a new building, hence Cal College. So here's a hidden jewel for, the, for, for those of us. So, so Gordon Sinclair wrote thank you notes to the many people that, uh, that visited that day. And this was really interesting. I have incidentally told our consultants about a central core area in the middle of the site. You'll remember that diagram that we saw, and we'll, we're gonna see another one in a minute, where the original plans for the campus were to fill the meadows up. And as we'll see again further down, the big, the big planning decision that was made to shape the campus was to put the, the heart of the campus back up in the trees. But it was interesting that as early as October of 1960, Worcester had been talking to people from Santa Cruz about doing that, moving it up into the center of the site. And Worcester wrote back, thanking him for his thank you note, and very interestingly said, the site is beautiful and it did take me back into my own past when I stood with Marion Hollins at Pasa Tiempo. So like the Cal Ranch in its general demeanor, the Great Plains sloping to the sea. Worcester and landscape architect Tommy Church, who will appear in a moment, uh, were the planners that were very much involved in, in establishing Pasa Tiempo in the early, uh, I'm sorry, in the 1930s. So in order to, uh, to convince the regents, they, they prepared this, the additional money that was done for this additional study, uh, prepared, prepared this proposal that went to the regents. They called it a prospectus. Uh, Lawrence Lackey, a well-known San Francisco urban designer, was in the lead. Uh, John Campbell and Worley Wong, architects who went on to design Merrill College at UCSC were the architects, and Bob Roy Robert Royston, uh, who's probably best known around here for his design of the, of the Quarry Amphitheater. He also incidentally designed the median strip up Bay Street leading up to the campus. I came across those drawings a few years ago and was surprised. They worked on this plan. And again, it proposed a campus mainly in the meadows. And I don't know if you can read what what they were proposing, single student residence halls, married student residences, fair, you know, physical sciences, mathematical sciences, physical education and military science, instructional athletics, a school of home economics, school of social work, school of public health. So this was really being seen as a very typical, the program was a very standard, very typical public university of the 1950s and the 1960s. 
uh, and they had some photographs of a possible model. And so you can actually see High Street is along here, and you can see the, the two ravines. The tree line, I think, is about, is about, was about here. Uh, and they proposed, uh, it was interesting, there was a university golf course up off of Empire Grade. Athletics was over in the Poganip. Uh, high density residential and commercial were at the entrance to the campus. Again, the, the, the city and county were trying to show how a future university campus would be integrated into the community. And we'll see that. It also, the proposal also committed the city and county to joint planning and development control consisting of the city, the county, the university, and I think the Cal Foundation was even in there at some point. So it took three more months to a final decision. There was a meeting in December of 1960 at which that drawing, that study was presented uh, and the regents expressed a unanimous preference for the Cal Ranch site and authorized the Office of the President to negotiate the purchase of the land. Uh, there were three months of negotiation involving the Cal Foundation. And in March of 1961, at a Regents meeting in Berkeley, the Regents voted 16 to 2 in favor of Santa Cruz. Interestingly, the two dissenting votes were the governor and the lieutenant governor. I suspect they knew there were more votes in Almaden than there were in Santa Cruz. It also points out Jerry, uh, not Jerry Pat Brown is something of a liar, because the story goes that uh, he explained the sighting of the three university campuses in Santa Cruz, Orange, and San Diego counties as being because those were the three counties who voted for Richard Nixon over him in the gubernatorial election in 1962. But he didn't do anything to put Santa Cruz, uh, to, to put a campus here, he voted against it. And then the headlines from the Mercury the next day, and from the Sentinel, Statements by prominent Santa Cruzans, and I'll just show, show one of them from the chair of the Board of Supervisors. The most significant thing that happened to Santa Cruz County in the last century. The county will be known as a university area, will help immeasurably in getting the research type industries we want and need to balance taxes. The university was seen not just as a cultural force, but as an economic uh, powerhouse. I see nothing but good, good in this. Our biggest problem now is ascertaining from the university as quickly as we can their time schedule. And it comes to planning the new campus. Now, as campus architect emeritus, I am very proud to say, and I say it whenever the opportunity presents itself, that the first employee of UC Santa Cruz was not its chancellor, but was its campus architect, Jack Wagstaff. Now, there may be a little fudge in that because McHenry couldn't be appointed until the regents approved him, but I did talk, I told you I'd met Bob Evans, the university architect before, and he told me how he came to suggest Wagstaff as the founding campus architect. Wagstaff had been the campus architect at UC San Francisco, and apparently he had just finished some very difficult project up there. And what Bob Evans said to me was, you know, we didn't know who the, who the chancellor was uh, gonna be at Santa Cruz, but we had to get going, we had to get started on the planning, he said, I figured if Jack Wagstaff could get along with all those doctors, he could get along with anyone. So he, without, without, any pro, without any hesitation, he appointed him as the first campus architect. And then the, the story is legendary about Kerr and McHenry having come respectable, respectively from, from uh, Swarthmore College and uh, UCLA, arguing the advantages of big and small. And the idea was, again, to build a big campus out of small colleges that would seem small while growing large. One of the things I was surprised by was to find correspondence from, uh, in, uh, from Bob Evans, the university architect, summarizing a meeting. And those of us from Santa Cruz always think of Santa Cruz as the experimental campus. But it's clear from this correspondence that Kerr saw all three new campuses as each in its own way being, um, being experimental. Some new pattern other, other than on the traditional conventional University of California academic administration pattern. College type development at Santa Cruz and a segmental type of development at Orange County. And if you know the, the plan at Irvine, there's a central park now called Aldrich Park after the founding chancellor, and around it were the academic disciplines. The way Santa Cruz was gonna be interdisciplinary was to have colleges with faculty from all disciplines in it. At, at Irvine, the idea was that the disciplinary boundaries would be created, but they would be convenient to each other. They could walk through the park. So Kerr very much was, was working hard to 
come up with a structure more successful than the mass education that marked much of the 50s and 60s. In December, September, December of 1961, the regents interviewed architects and they, in February of 62, uh, pr uh, appointed a master planning team head headed by John Carl Warnicke, Theodore Bernardi, William Worcester's partner, and Worcester Bernardi and Emmons, Bob Anchin and Stephen Allen from Anchin and Allen, who had done a lot of the Eichler houses over the hill, along with a lot of, uh, a lot of commercial and, and, uh, and um, commercial work. Uh, Ernest Kump, who among other things did, did schools throughout California, he was the architect of Cabrillo College, for example, and landscape architect Thomas Church. Now, I heard from two different people a story about these interviews. Uh, apparently it was done at a classroom building at Berkeley and you know, like most many universities, there are windows and classroom doors. And the story goes, uh, there were these, these firms had all been interviewed for the master plan and so had Gardner Daly, a Berkeley architect, faculty member, and Skidmore Owings and Merrill, the international firm. And the um, story goes that Warnicke went up as, as Nat Owings was making his presentation and looked through the door and came back and saw, talked to these uh, assembled guys and said, he said, you, we're really screwed. He said, Nat Owings is up there standing in front of a map of the world and it's covered with red dots. So, so, so clearly Owings was saying, you know, look at all the work we've done all over the place. SOM made it clear they weren't interested in collaborating. I don't know what Gardner Daly, I don't know, he wasn't, but they then put together this master planning team that then made its first visit to the campus in March of 1962, standing at the edge of the lower quarry. Uh, they started off by really trying to understand the land, and I think it's here we start to see the influence of landscape architect Tommy, Thomas Church, Tommy Church, as everybody called him, looking at the various zones and understanding the topography since it was so dominant. Um, these drawings were presented for a visit by the Regents Grounds and Building Committee to the Santa Cruz campus in, in, uh, to the site in July of 1962. Uh, and it's here that the formal idea of moving the core of the campus from the meadow areas up into the center was first presented to the regents and the regents approved and that moved the long range development plan forward. Probably the single most important planning decision made uh, in, in laying out the campus. Uh, and then this wonderful photograph, uh, which you can't read here, is that these cars were all loaned by the same uh, automobile dealership that provided cars for the Miss California pageant, which used to be held in Santa Cruz every year. And one of the regents was quoted as saying something like, well, we've got the cars, where are the, where are the girls? Uh, <laughs> and then the final long range development plan was prepared from July of 62. I said January of 63, as you'll see, that's when the regents approved it. The, the final publication date was actually September of 1963. But again, the idea was to have a core of facilities that would serve all of the colleges surrounded by smaller residential colleges around it. But it would fill almost all of the land of the campus and what was known, referred to as the Great Meadow, was, is the area which is now below the Chancellor's House and the arts area on campus. Uh, and that's the plan. Um, this is a look at the core area of the plan. This actually, you can start to see, this is pretty much the way Cal College looks. So clearly those plans had come, had come fairly far. The library is about here. Um, but here's another surprise. I, uh, as, as I was working on the, the uh, researching the architectural history of the campus, I was in, in what we would call the vault. This was, a, this was a concrete fireproof room, maybe 100 feet from where my office was for many years, going through drawings that I'd never seen before. And I opened one, one big tube and pulled out a drawing about this big of the center of the campus. Uh, in fact, we had that on one wall at our exhibition and among our, among our visitors was a landscape architect named Mike Painter. And Painter had worked in Warnicke's office as this was going on. And I had I'd invited him to come, and I was glad to see him uh, arrive. And um, I'll tell a Mike Painter story in a minute. And I said, oh, there's a drawing over on that wall that might interest you, Mike. He's, I said, you might have actually made it. So he went over and looked at it, and he came to me and said, yeah. He said, I think I did that drawing some 50 years before. But this is pretty much where the library is. This is where Cal College is going to be. This is fairly early. But I'll call your attention to what was going to be the administration building. 
this is about where the student center is, what's now called the Academic Resource Center. And again, going through Warnicke's archives uh, up in up in Healdsburg, uh, that's a that's a, a diagram uh, done by Olaf Dahlstrand. Olaf Dahlstrand is the architect I worked for in Carmel, who did a lot of renderings for Warnicke uh, about what that was. What you would see as you came up, uh, a very again a very different style of architecture was envisioned in those early days. Now the other surprise. Um, this is about where Natural Sciences II is, and you'll see a little plaza there and a, and a blob in the center of it. Oh gosh, when, when was this? This was probably 10 years, but this was probably around 2000. Somebody came into my office uh, with a roll of, of drawings and unrolled these big, tall, pastel sketches. And they said, do you know what these are? And I said, I've never seen those before. I don't know. Well, if you turn that around, you would say something about Mark Roque's sketches. And when I had worked for Olaf Dahlstrand, the renderer who did this, the, the diagram I showed you just a minute ago, he had told me that there was a young French architect uh, working in Warnicke's office who'd come along to help with these, these with, with, with drawings and with the planning. And um, so I called Olaf, he was still alive at the time, and I said, was his name Mark Roque? And he said, yeah, I think that was it. So that, that triggered it to be part of the, uh, original long-range development planning effort from 62 and 63. But then that was confirmed in the long-range development plan. On a dominating knoll will be located a vertical architectural symbol, a great tower, which rising through the trees will provide orientation within the campus and identification from without. Um, there is, in, in Berkeley's regional history project, an oral history of Tommy Church, although he was very ill and couldn't speak. They interviewed a lot of his colleagues, and Jack Wagstaff, the founding architect, campus architect, said, they asked him about this, this tower. Well, I think Warnicke kind of visualized one, and Tommy Church repeatedly would say, if there's anything that this campus doesn't need, it's a Campanile. <laughs> so there was a model with a dowel that that he pulled out and according to Wagstaff, the hole was still there. That's long forgotten, thank goodness. So this is, this is Church and he wrote, uh, the, pro the planning had gone on um, quite a ways and again I heard from several different people um, one of the stories about leading up to the idea of moving the campus into the north. And I heard this from Derek Parker who was a longtime partner of Anchin and Allen. Uh, and I also heard it from Duke Oakley, who was the longtime campus architect at UCLA, who worked in Warnicke's office. And uh, they were at a meeting. They would review each other's work as they went on, and they were at a meeting one afternoon, and, and apparently Church asked the group, you know, what does everybody remember about the site? And everybody talked about the meadows and the vistas, and he said, well, if that's the most valuable part of the site, why would we put buildings on it? And that's what got to the idea of moving to the north. Uh, but as it went on, they were starting to work on design guidelines, and again, the story goes, it, it, um, Church sent a, a memo to Jack Wagstaff with a, with a transmittal memo saying he jotted these ideas down in bumpy air on an airplane flight coming back from Albuquerque, uh, and it's sort of notes on the Santa Cruz campus, and these are some of the things he said. Any attempt of the design to compete in grandeur with the site is doomed to failure. Since the site is going to win in any case, it's possible that the twin theories of delicate contrast and protective coloring are the most likely to succeed. The general effect must be one of sensible, sensitive collaboration between the designer and this spectacular environment. The wall-to-wall -wall forest carpet will disappear and in its place must come not the asphalt jungle, not the standard campus that we have known, not an automobile under every redwood, but a vast area in which to live and study. Magnificent in conception, daring and forthright in its architecture, but gentle be the hand it lays upon the land. And that actually, that actually, that document was actually given along with some notes that Ansel Adams had made on the campus to all architects before they started working on their early projects on the campus. January of 1963, I think I mentioned this earlier, the regents met in Santa Cruz to consider the preliminary long-range development plan. Um, the surprise was standard form, like any bureaucracy, there are agendas for regents meetings and we would always work on preparing what was called a regents item for any project that needed approval. On the cover of the regents item for the approval of the preliminary long range development plan and the first campus designs was a quote 
from Frederick Law Olmsted, the, really the father of American landscape architecture, known for his design of Central Park. Uh, there's a wonderful biography of Olmsted that came out a few years ago. I wish I remembered the author. He, he effectively was the head of what was the equivalent of the Red Cross for the Union Army during the Civil War. And after that, he had been sent out. He managed a mining camp in the Sierras, and knowing his reputation, Congress sent him to look at Yosemite and to evaluate it. First point to be kept in mind is the preservation and maintenance as exactly as possible of the natural scenery. And permitting the sacrifice of anything that would be of the slightest value to future visitors to the convenience, bad taste, playfulness, carelessness, or wanton destruction of the present visit visitors, we probably yield in each case the interest of uncounted millions to the selfishness of a few. Clearly, the regents were being primed to think of this campus as really something quite special. So uh, the regents, the notes from that meeting record that, again, at the first congregational church, they went out and took a tour, an informal tour of the site was conducted, focused on the dominant natural settings of the area, rugged knolls, steep ravines, rolling hills, natural quarry, and stands of redwoods. This was memorialized in the Sentinel. A bunch of white guys with plans. And again, a photograph of, the, of that meeting, Warren, I keep presenting. This is the, this effectively the plan that we've seen over and over again. Uh, some photographs, they hired Ansel Adams to take photographs of the site to, to uh, illustrate the long range development plan. Uh, standard practice is that the regents committees meet one day, take their actions and make a recommendation to the full board and the full board endorses them on the following day. So in January 18th of 1963, that long range development plan was, was approved by the full board. Here's the surprise. Um, there were concerns about what this new experimental campus was going to cost. So Clark Kerr added to the language of the Regents item, subject to the condition that state funded capital and operating costs shall not exceed the comparable cost per students on, on the other campuses. I wish I'd known that when I started my time as campus architect because I would have known who to blame when we couldn't meet building budgets. The UC development plan gets, a ho gets the go-ahead, the headline from the Sentinel the next day, but I like the subhead better. Preserve beauty of sight, regents tell architects. Chairman Gerald Hager of the board also urged the architects to make every effort to preserve the beauty and the land of what he termed the university's most exciting new campus. Now, the surprise is not there's lots of talk that this was all in response to the free speech movement at Berkeley. But if you look at the dates, this was December of 1964, almost two years. Remember that the regents approved that plan in January of 63. So this is almost two years later. But uh, the, the, the story is actually much more interesting than the free speech movement leading to Santa Cruz. In fact, I think it's the other way around. Dean McHenry's academic background was a political scientist. And he thought like a politician. And I think he used the trouble at Berkeley to make the case to, to the regents to spend money on the Santa Cruz campus. Because at about this time, just a, a month after the free speech movement occurred, uh, an article, William Trombley is the time staff writer who wrote frequently about Santa Cruz. It talks about a cost feasibility study. Chancellor McHenry feared that the regents might consider for title study to be grounds for drastically revising, but their fears proved baseless. Chancellor McHenry said after the vote that undoubtedly Berkeley's FSM troubles had contributed to the regent's determination to push ahead at Santa Cruz. The it will cost more syndrome seemed weaker, said McHenry. We are heartened by this increased concern for the undergraduate. And I don't have any doubt that McHenry was conveying that, regent, that message to the regents even before that vote occurred. Um, the other thing that was interesting, you'll recall in this document, when the city and county made its proposal, its prospectus to the campus, they agreed to work collaboratively with, uh, with the university to, to develop the environs. And this was a study that was done called the Environs Plan, prepared by two, two um, planners from Berkeley with links to the UC Berkeley Department of City Planning. They, in fact, were the planners who were working on the city's general plan at the same time. Uh, and what it proposed was significant coordination and review among the city, the county, and the university. 
Uh, and this is what the, the general plan, the environmental plan, I'm sorry, the environs plan called for, designed to create a residential community to integrate the campus in the city of Santa Cruz. Again, it paid a lot of attention to the natural beauty of the site, and not just the 2,000 acres of the campus, but the surrounding area as well. But it was proposing 65,000 people on 4,000 acres. Those, that's 65,000 new residents in Santa Cruz. 17 neighborhoods, each with a 12-acre elementary school site. Five junior high and three high school sites. And medium to high density housing concentrated along Bay and High Streets. Uh, and a major community and shopping center up off of, uh, of Cave, the Cave Gulch neighborhood, intended to complement what was downtown. Uh, and on the back cover of the environs plan is that plan showing bridges across the ravine into the campus in a fairly densely developed area of commercial and office space. Uh, the appendix to the study included a set of proposed development and subdivision standards and recommended a nonprofit land development and management corporation that include the city, the county, the university, and the Cal Foundation. Again, that never came to pass. Um, in May of 1964, the regents approved the environmental, the environs plan in principle. Uh, this is as far as my research got. In December, the city council and the county board of supervisors were scheduled to meet for a joint approval of, pl of the plan. Uh, the university was supposed to work on an agreement about what would happen to the area between Mission Street, Highway 1, and the ocean. Uh, and again, I didn't dig any further in to see whether that actually happened, because that was, I'd, I'd run out of steam on my, on my research for my article. And then in September of 1965, the students arrived and everything changed. Um, you, will, you may recognize some of the faces in these, in these photographs from 19, in the, in the, in the, really the anti-war protests of the, of the 69 and 70. So then what happened? Uh, in part, the regents actually uh, wrote a policy on community planning that I believe is still on the books with a few minor reservations that talked about the city being, the university being a good neighbor. Uh, and they actually did environ surveys and plans. They did one for Santa Cruz in 1968 and in 1970, they'd done them for all the campuses. They actually hired two community planners at the office of the president and they divided the campuses between them uh, and they were intended to work closely with the campuses and with local jurisdictions to collaborate the planning. But that wound up being eliminated in 1978 in, the, in one of the budget cutbacks and it was never restored. Uh, and then of course the environmental movement came along. CEQA was created in 1970. 1972 Proposition 20 created the Coastal Commission. And in 1979 here in Santa Cruz, Major O formalized the, the Santa Cruz Green Belt. The, the LRDP predicted that the influences would be in two directions. University through its staff, students, and program of activities will have a strong impact on the surrounding communities. At the same time, the character of Santa Cruz will continuously affect the growth and life of the university campus. And having you know, spent nearly, well, over 20 years in the University of California and visiting other campuses, I do think one of its great strengths is the fact that each campus was relatively autonomous. The character of UC Santa Cruz is so, has been so much shaped by its environment that we are very different than UC Irvine or UC San Diego or UC Davis. And I think that's, that's quite appropriate. So I'm gonna turn now to some of the things that didn't make it into my article and what I call the cutting room floor. Um, and these are some quotes about how people visiting the site reacted to the site before the university was here. Theodore Bernardi, when he was being interviewed uh, in, in the Berkeley Environmental Design Archives, is a statement he gave to the regents uh, about his reactions to the site and how he thought of things, and it was really quite wonderful. But he talks about the houses, barns, and related buildings were conceived in an age of architectural ser serenity that may at least suggest a move that we may hope to capture in developing the environment of the university. Uh, I like this business about remind us of the chain of development that I believe is an essential element of orderly existence. And this is a photograph of the entrance to Cal College that he designed, I think trying to take into account with the heavy timber construction, much of, much of what he'd observed in the early campus, the early Cal Ranch buildings. Lewis Mumford paid a visit to the site in 1961. He was uh, visiting at Berkeley and came down and spent the day and talked about 
using great density in some areas so that you can use open spaces, possible to retain the rolling hills in the setting to make the best of the majestic site. And again, he focused on the splendor of the site. The site is ideal for development of university, he emphasized. Ansel Adams was close to the campus. As I said, the, the master planning team had hired him to photograph the campus. And that may have given rise to a project he did for the whole university system a few years later uh, called Fiat Lux. It's a photographic essay about all the campuses that was published as part of its 100th anniversary celebration in the late 60s. But he talks about, uh, he, he did notes on the site, and then many of those notes made their way into a speech he gave to the UCSE affiliates in March of 1965. And over and over again, he stresses the fact that the setting is part of the education of the student. Um, it's a really quite lovely thing to read. Uh, it's also interesting to look around the world to see some of the contemporary institutions that were being built at, at the same time as UC Santa Cruz to understand how unique the campus is. First one was an exact contemporary of, UC, uh, of UCSE. It opened in September of 1965, Simon Fraser University in Burnaby, British Columbia, just, uh, just very close to Vancouver. And here it was at the top of a mountain, and there was a design competition that Canadian architects Arthur Erickson and Jeffrey Massey won. The other architects that competed worked on developing really what at the time was known as a megastructure of interconnected buildings, and given Canadian weather, that, that makes a lot of sense. But again, and their approach to interdisciplinarity was to make it easy for one discipline to get to, to another rather than to connect it. And for those of you who've been there, it's really, it sounds like it could be, it could be um, quite awful, but it's really quite wonderful and quite spectacular. It too, interestingly enough, Simon Fraser had a reputation. I think they hired a bunch of faculty from Berkeley, so there was, it, it had a reputation for um, dissent and controversy as well. Also at the same time in Chicago, uh, February 1965, Richard J. Daly, the original Daly, cut the ribbon for a new campus known at the time as Circle Campus. This actually was a follow-up. Uh, the University of Illinois had opened a campus on Navy Pier in Chicago to meet the needs of returning servicemen after World War II, and this was actually going to formalize it. Its architect was a Chicago architect named Walter Netsch, who, who worked for Skidmore Owings in Merrill, who had a field theory, uh, which then, as you can see here, had a lot of elevated walkways and again a very geometrical orthogonal grid. Uh, it proved to be, the, the, the walkways proved to be just disastrous and awful in the winter time. They've all been removed and now you, walk, you circulate on, on the ground. But again, it rather turned its back on the, on the neighborhood. Uh, I had just come back, when I did this presentation, I had just come back from a tour of Cuba with the uh, Society of Architectural Historians, and one of the places we visited was a new technical, uni well, relatively new technical university, uh, December of 1964, again, roughly contemporary with UC Santa Cruz, on the outskirts of Havana. They had decided to move, this is one of the few post-revolutionary building projects uh, that, the, that, the, that the Castro government was able to complete. Um, and it moved the architecture and engineering disciplines from University of Anna, which is downtown, out to the, uh, these outskirts. But what was so interesting about it is the, uh, the, it was a Cuban architect, Humberto Alonso. Uh, but they used a lift slab system from Canada. They built vertical supports, and then they would build what are called waffle slabs on the ground for each floor, and then jack them up into the sky to create the floors of the buildings. And we met with Cuban architects where we were there, one, one of them who's very well known about, he's written books about modern architecture in Havana, said the two things you want are shade and cross ventilation. And by raising these all up, there are very few pieces of the building on the ground. So by walking under the buildings, you're both in shade and you're in areas where cross ventilation occurs. And the pictures don't ca capture the feeling of the place. It's really quite terrific. Here's another origin myth. You recognize these guys? <laughs> Fidel and Che. Now, there are several versions of what's going on here and several different versions of where it occurred and when it occurred. So you're going to have to go with me because this is the one that I like. That um, in the aftermath of the revolution, uh, Fidel, there was a, a country club 
uh, on the outskirts of Havana in the ritziest neighborhood. And they went to play golf there. And as they walked around, the story goes, Che knew about golf from growing up in Argentina. So Fidel had a score of about 150 going around the 18 holes. And Che had a score of about 127. So, um, so again, the, the version that I, that I like is that this happened at the Havana Country Club. And as they looked around, they said, well, we need to make this space available to all the people. What are we going to do? Um, this is within a month of the regents picking the Cal Ranch site for UC Santa Cruz. They said, we'll build an art school. We'll build an art school for Cubans and for people from all around the world to come to, the, to, come to Cuba. Now, does anything about this plan remind you of UC Santa Cruz? Cluster, 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 cluster. The idea was to have five separate clusters of five different schools, ballet, music, modern dance, plastic arts, and dramatic arts. But as this was going on, this was uh, actually, these are, there's a, I first heard about this at a podcast, 99% of Invisible, that comes out of Oakland. Uh, and then a couple of follow-up uh, articles. John Loomis, a Bay Area architect, wrote, about, wrote a book about the, the art schools. And then there's a, a DVD, a, a documentary film called Unfinished Spaces about it. Um, and they brought together, they, there was a, a Cuban architect who had fallen out of favor with the Batista regime and he'd gone to Venezuela to work and there he met two Italian architects. After the revolution, he came back to Cuba. Somehow he was connected to the, to the Castro administration. And so when Fidel decided they were gonna build this art school, I think this was you know January, February, Fidel wanted it open that fall. Um, yeah, fat chance. Um, Porro called Ricardo Porro was the, the Cuban architect. He invited the two uh, Italian architects that he had met uh, to back, and they, they started working on this. Amer the American embargo was starting to kick in, so it was hard to get supplies from Americans, like reinforcing steel. So they turned to an ancient form of construction with, uh, that's often used as Catalonian tiles. Very thin tiles are able to create arches without reinforcement. And so most of these facilities are you know, very, very curved. This is the art school that Porto designed. Uh, this is the dance school that he also designed. Those are the only two that came into full operation because as this was going on, Russian influence in Cuba was increasing. Industrialized building was taking form. This was seen as a counter-revolutionary experiment. So a couple of the schools were never finished. The School of Ballet, for example, and the story goes that they actually did start teaching, with the Russian presence in Cuba, they taught, the Russian circus performers taught circus arts in the, this also was, um, uh, Alicia Alonso, who is the famous Cuban prima ballerina, uh, was to head this school, but she never wanted to build her because ballerinas rely, ballet relies on a proscenium stage, and she didn't want to be dancing in a round stage. So there is a, a school of ballet, but it's in a conventional building in downtown, in downtown Havana, and this was never used. But you can get a sense of how thin that those arches were with that dome there. And I think that's it. And I think we have time for questions. Did I get it right? Was I okay about Hal? Did I? Uh, at least we got his handwriting figured out. Okay, good. Yeah. Frank, you mentioned that the city was somewhat progressive, but it was also a very much a Republican stronghold. But those two, in, the, in those days, those weren't, those weren't contradictory at all. Um, you know, there, I'm sure that many of the people on those committees were Republicans. And when I arrived in 1967, the the the, uh, you know, the the representative of the Congress, our Congressman Bert Talbot, was a Talcott Talbot Bert Talcott Bert Talcott was extremely was very conservative. I mean, it was really the university that changed the political orientation. But in those days, you know, progressive and Republican weren't weren't contradictory. In fact, when I worked. Uh, for Richard Peterson, he mentioned that the county building was actually an interesting experiment. I know very little about it, I've done no research on it, but it was sort of done with prefabricated units, which I suspect part of the progressive looking to the future of things influenced the design of the county building in that way, because that was the way, of the, the way that buildings like that were gonna be built in the future. 
Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's 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 a building only an architect could love. Sort of like Worcester Hall at UC Berkeley. Yeah. Another question is, I understand the campus was pretty much cut off. I mean, the, the lumber was pretty much cut off around 1890, 19. I'd always heard of yeah. That's that's what I've heard. In fact, when we were. Um, when we were walking the site of what was of what became colleges nine and ten, we were there with a forester from Big Creek Lumber, and he was he was telling us. He said, "You know, you can see that this was all clear cut around around the turn of the previous century." And he, I mean, he could, he, I, I don't remember what they were, but but given his forester's eye, he could explain how he knew that from what he saw. But that's right. There's as far as I know, there's no first growth on the Santa Cruz campus. It's all second growth. Yeah. Um, just to to clarify that, it was like 1903, um, just before Henry Cowell died, and he had a conversation with his son. And they, at that point, they had to switch from using redwood to five to, to for the lime kilns to using um, heating oil. So it was they they had to make that conscious decision. We no longer, and it was this conflict between father and son where, where it was like. And it was all about Teddy Roosevelt coming to Santa Cruz and Cowell wanting Roosevelt to think that he was a conservationist. And son says, what are you talking about? You know, we're, we've cut all our redwoods and all we have left is we have to fuel the lime kills with heating oil. So, so, so did they, did, it wasn't that they ran out of redwood. They made that choice to preserve other lands? No, oh, it was, they had run out of, out of redwood. Okay. Yeah. And there was none left of all of their holdings in, in Santa Cruz County. So that was the, the real mark of when they decided they had to go to heating oil. Uh, maybe you can add, this was uh, something that came up early in the, uh, before, before we got here, I, I heard years ago, but never, never was confirmed, this was just oral history, that this little notch of land with the, where the um, Montessori School and the goat farm and so on are there, was land that Cowell had actually set aside for his employees to build houses on. Do you know, do you know anything about that? No. Okay. I, I do, I do drive Ah, okay, all right. <laughs> okay, got it, all right. Okay. Got it, yeah. Yeah. Break with this ethic of staying in the trees, or has that eroded over time? Are you you're talking about the current proposal? The current proposal. It's a big break. I mean, I think that's why it's so controversial. Yeah. Um, on again, off again. It's all in the California Museum of Photography, which is run by UC Riverside. And I used to be able to show a website where you could find, you could actually find them and look at them online. Um, uh, and the last time I went there, it was dead. But you might Google Fiat Looks Con Connection, Fiat Looks Collection, UC Riverside, and I, you may be able to find it there. But many of them are digitized through the California Museum of Photography. Yeah. And there's also, there, there was also a book published called Fiat Lux, and you can, I don't know whether the public library would have it, but you could probably find it, at, certainly in the university library. Because yeah, Jim? You can see prints of his pictures in the UCSC special collection, but with the one proviso, they're not exhibition quality prints, because the good prints uh, got burned up in a fire. Yeah, the Central Services building burned in 1971. And, and, and McHenry's office, a lot of stuff burned up, along with, it, along with uh, his first prints. So he substituted his work prints, which are pretty good, but not great. And they won't let you uh, exhibit them. They can't have them because they're not, you know... I have a I have a, a high school classmate who's a who's a historian of photography and has done been doing research into Ansel Adams and his photographs and there the trust that controls those rights is ferocious. I mean they are just they're leg they're legendary for how difficult they are about dealing and how how vigorously they enforce their copyrights. Yep. Where was the controversial Eastern accent? 
uh, it's the route has never been established, uh, and it's not shown. It's interesting. I don't know if this was supposed to be it. That doesn't really look big enough to be a road because it doesn't look like it's done there. I was actually early in my term as campus architect, uh, an engineer who'd done a lot of work on campus. Uh, came by and they'd been looking, there is, there, let me back up, there is somewhere in the university's files uh, a, a plan of this area of the Poganip that looks like a plate of spaghetti because it's got all of the various routes that were considered over time on it. And John Rutherford, this, this engineer who'd been hired by the campus to look at alternative routes, had delivered his work product and stuck his head in my office and he says, I have to tell you, I hope it never gets built. I said, what? I said, you're an engineer, you're supposed to build stuff, John. He said, yeah, but he said the retaining walls it would need. He said, he said, I, he said, I know, I'm not supposed to say stuff like that, but I hope we never, we never have to build it. So I, I don't think the alignment was ever determined. So Route 4 would have come up through Pogonet? I think that's right, and come through here, yeah. yeah and then go up through Westlake and there was some very prominent wealthy People who lived there, and that was not so, so the fact that I came down to the Civic Auditorium to protest in about 1969 didn't have as much to do with it as those <laughs> prominent people. Then what about the underground caves? I heard a story about uh, underneath McHenry Library. Was I've heard. I've heard that too. I don't know. I don't know that for a fact that somebody could walk all the way to the ocean in or something like that. Well, the contractor who built McHenry was he finally went the antitimon materials. He dumped cement down in there for months. The one, the one I heard about was uh, what's now uh, the Baskin Engineering Building, and in fact there is, uh, and in fact we put it in the in our in our exhibition in 2015. I came across in the in the archives a photograph of one of those sinkholes with a ladder down into it, and it was pretty it was pretty ferocious. So they actually had to they they wound up putting it on piles. So no, in fact, um, one of the first projects I worked on when I arrived at the campus when I joined the campus staff was, was the, the swimming pool. And um, the architect had done a layout and they went to do some soils borings. And um, they just came and shook their head and said, it's like toothpaste down there. So they redesigned and found another site for it. The soils engineer said, oh, I think it's gonna be better here than over there. And I actually, I happened to be up at the site when, the, when, the, when they were doing the borings. And they brought up one, they, they sent a six inch auger down and uh, then they send down a, what they call a split coupling ring and drive it down and then they can bring up a soil sample. And they were just bringing one of those up and he opened it up and put it in my hand and I could push my finger into it like, it was like beach sand. I mean, it was very, very gooey. Uh, what was interesting about that though, and, and it goes to show how unpredictable the, the geological conditions are on campus. Um, so the, the, the swim, there was a separate architect and a separate engineer for the swimming pool because that's fairly specialized. And they were going to put the build, they were going to actually build it on pilings. So they had laid out a, a grid of pilings. And of course in the deep end, it's deeper, there's more water, they were closer together than the shallow end. And the geotechnical engineer had the boring company bore at each of those pilings. And they got to one of them and uh, you know the arg was going down and down and down and down. And what had happened in some of the earlier ones is it hit this, this pocket of wet soil and they could just push it straight forward. Well, on this one, they couldn't push it, but there were no, there were no spoils coming up from the arg. I mean, you know, when you, when you do a drill, there's always stuff that's coming out, nothing was coming out. So the geotechnical engineer said, um, said, you know, when you've been doing this long enough, you get a little red flag goes up in the back of your head and you don't ignore them. So he actually uh, sent the drilling company home and arranged to have a video camera sent down. So a week later, the drillers came back and they, they went to where they'd found the suspect condition and 10 feet away they drilled and it didn't recur. Two feet away they drilled and it didn't recur. Two feet on the other side of the hole, they got, they got what was happening. So they pulled up the auger and they sent this um, TV camera, sort of a fisheye lens at the bottom of a cylindrical tube that fit exactly into the boring shaft. And you could see, you could, we've, they videotaped it and you could watch it going down and you could see the auger marks on the walls of the, of the hole. And then as it got further down, all of a sudden you saw stones, rocks. I mean, there were, there were 
there were rocks, you know, fist size, a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller, and it clearly it was a, a filled cavity. And because they were rocks and not soil, they provided the resistance that the auger was experiencing, but they weren't coming up. They were just being pushed off to the side. And so that answered the question, and the, and the geotechnical engineer uh, redesigned it and they didn't use pilings, they used a different structural system for the pool. And a few years later, one of his technicians who'd been working on the project was studying for her PhD at Berkeley and was in a, in a soils engineering class. And lo and behold, that project came up as a good example of what to do in a circumstance like that. So. Anything else? Well, thanks so much for your interest.